welcome to episode 48 of Radicals in Conversation, the monthly podcast from Pluto Press, one of the world's leading independent radical publishers. I'm your host, Chris Brown. On the 25th of May 2018, the Irish people voted to remove the Eighth Amendment from the Constitution. This amendment, which had been added in 1983, not only made abortion illegal in Ireland, but equated the life of a pregnant woman to the life of a fertilised embryo. Despite this criminalisation, the ban on abortion was always resisted and circumvented. In the years leading up to the 2018 referendum, a grassroots movement pushing for repeal emerged on an unprecedented scale, sending tens of thousands of people out canvassing in villages, towns and cities across the country. This victory for the Irish repeal movement set the country alight with euphoria, but for some the celebrations were short-lived. The new legislation turned out to be one of the most conservative in Europe, People still travel overseas for abortions, and services are not yet commissioned in the north of Ireland. This month, Pluto published a new book, Repealed, Ireland's Unfinished Fight for Reproductive Rights, by Camilla Fitzsimons, with Sinead Kennedy, and a foreword from Ruth Coppinger. The book is, of course, 50% off for podcast listeners. You just have to use the coupon PODCAST at the checkout on plutobooks.com. Well, it's a real pleasure to be joined on the show today by Camilla, Sinead and Ruth. We'll be discussing the history of the Catholic Church and women's oppression in Ireland, the introduction of the Eighth Amendment in 1983 and the qualitative turning points in the long road to repeal. We'll also be considering the lessons from the campaign and the challenges that still remain more than three years later. As advance notice to listeners, our conversation today does touch on some potentially triggering subjects, including suicide and rape. So this is Camilla Fitzsimons, Sinead Kennedy and Ruth Coppinger on Radicals and Conversation. Camilla, Sinead, Ruth, I'd like to thank you all very much for being here today. It's wonderful to have you involved in this discussion. I thought we could start by just doing a quick go around. Could each of you tell us a little bit about yourselves, uh, your involvement in the book and politically and so on? So uh, perhaps we'll start with you, Camilla. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Camilla Fitzsimons. Thanks for, for having me, Chris. Um, in terms of my involvement with the book, I suppose I'd best describe myself as the principal author, but really in many respects what I am or what I kind of created was a receptacle for many voices to be heard. So, you know, this book repealed, uh, although principally authored by me with significant contribution from uh, Sinead, in particular one of the other guests, it also has, you know, over 400 ordinary activists uh, participating. I, that's how I think of myself, I guess, as an ordinary activist, um, wouldn't have been involved at that sort of coordinating level for uh, a lot of the repeal campaign, much more, you know, grassroots in and out of the campaign sporadically over a number of years, which I think is the way many people's story is told. Great. Thanks, Camilla. Okay. Uh, Sinead, how about you next? Hi, Chris. Um, and thanks very much for inviting me. I've been an activist for a long time. Um, I got involved, I think, around in the late 1990s when I was a, when I was a student. And I suppose I continued my involvement in reproductive politics in Ireland. I worked with Ava Smith um, in 2013 to set up the coalition to repeal the Eighth Amendment. And that became one of the three organisations in Together for Yes. And I did some work with Together for Yes during the campaign. I, I led the research team. For Together for Yes. And I suppose I made a small contribution to, it is very much Camilla's book, um, but I, I made a small contribution, I suppose, in outlining the kind of historical context and some of the kind of earlier movements to repeal. And I was, I was very honoured for Camilla to ask me to be involved with, which I think is a really important project. Fantastic. Thanks, Sinead. And Ruth, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, I'm Ruth Carpenter and I'm a long time activist and socialist. Um, I suppose I would now call myself a bit more a socialist feminist because of the particular importance of women's oppression and how important it's become as a political issue. I was a TD, a member of parliament for six years from 2014 to 2020. And I was in the, the parliament when repeal became such a big issue. I would have proposed repeal bills you know, to repeal the Eighth Amendment from the Constitution. Spoke a lot on it in the doll, but also outside the doll, I'm involved with ROSA, which is a socialist feminist organisation, which did 
work on the ground in terms of civil disobedience, particularly with the abortion pills and the attempt being to portray the realities for working class women and ordinary pregnant people. So that's it. Fantastic. Thanks to all of you, as I say, for being here. Long time listeners of this show may remember we did an episode on Repeal the Eighth just before the referendum. So, yeah, three and a half years ago. So it's really nice to be able to revisit the subject in light of the result and in light of what's transpired since. But first, maybe just because I'm aware that most of our listeners are either based in Britain or elsewhere and therefore might not be that familiar with Irish politics. Could someone give us a very short crash course on the Irish political landscape? Uh, Who are the major political parties in the country? And what was their position, uh, differing positions perhaps, around the issue of repeal? Well, the political system in Ireland facilitates smaller parties, but throughout the last hundred years has been two big parties, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael. And they've generally ruled maybe with the support of a couple of smaller parties or individuals. And they've been the two parties most associated with church and state being absolutely interconnected throughout our history, which led to particular history in Ireland of misogynistic events like the mother and baby homes and Magdalene laundries, which I'm sure listeners will be familiar with, and which also then led to, in 1983, a ban being placed in the Constitution on abortion, the Eighth Amendment. And, you know, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael have interchanged power between them and, in my opinion, will be very loath to break the connection that still exists between church and state. And they would generally be considered, you know, economically conservative or right-wing, neoliberal in terms of economics, but they've been extremely backward on social issues as well. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Ruth. Well, I mean, having touched on the relationship between church and state then, I would like to maybe start with some of the history, right? Because you mentioned the Magdalene laundries, the mother and baby homes, and I'm not sure if everyone will know a huge amount about those, but perhaps we can come to that in a minute. Could someone say a little bit about the role that the Catholic Church has historically played in Ireland, maybe in the years since independence with the Irish Free State and then later? You know, how did the Catholic Church become so established and its values, you know, conservative patriarchal values, basically synonymous with the national identity that sort of emerged in the free state period? Because, yeah, the relationship between church and state is much stronger in Ireland than maybe in some other countries. One way that I think it's sometimes put in Ireland is that, you know, when colonisation by the United Kingdom ended in Ireland, it was very quickly replaced with colonisation by the Catholic Church. And really from from very early on, a very cosy coalition was established between, as Ruth described it, a kind of a interchanging Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael government who had such a strong connection with the Catholic Church, both in terms of kind of individual relationships with archbishops and, and key people, as well as large infrastructural connections in terms of the introduction of legislation, which fundamentally erased women from Irish society, you know, women weren't, were sacked from their jobs if they got married. Basically, on the day of their marriage, they, they weren't allowed to work anymore. There was legislation introduced to stop women from taking up positions on juries. There was, you know, very significant fundamental practices put in place, as I say, to erase women from society. And then also very, very strong cultural church-led messages, which really silenced people and really controlled just about every aspect of people's lives in a way that very clearly defined the role of a woman as somebody who was to stay at home, that her job was to be a mother, to be a wife, and that was it. But I think, you know, an important part of the story that's sometimes missed as well is that that's kind of the experience for for middle-class women. I mean, there was working-class women in Ireland who endured all of those same structural systems but still had to work so had to work in agriculture had to work in factories had to work in other menial jobs but at the same time were still principally cast in that role of a wife and mother Mm, yeah and what were some of the functions i guess that the church performed in terms of what we might consider to be state functions 
for instance, in education or healthcare? Well, I mean, that's not historical. I mean, the, the, the Catholic Church in Ireland still controls the education system. I mean, there are small pockets of alternative models if you're in Dublin, for example, or some other large urban areas. But the vast majority of schools in Ireland are under Catholic patronage and their ethos is still very much leads the education system in Ireland. And our health system also has the legacy of being church run. There is a controversy at the moment about the ownership of our new National Maternity Hospital, which has essentially been gifted to the Catholic Church by um, the current government. I would just kind of add to that, you know, in terms of what you're saying, that there is very much a kind of, it was a coalition, I think, between the Irish state and the Catholic Church. And I think we also have to look at um, the role that the Irish state, the Irish capitalist state played in this, because women's sexuality in particular functioned as one of the kind of principal ideological bulwarks for the Irish state from its foundation in 1922, this partitioned state. And one of the things that it it did, I think, is that it allowed this newly formed post-colonial state to disassociate itself from the kind of revolutionary struggles that were very central to its foundation, which included significant socialist and feminist movements. So I think the repression of women, and as Camilla said, the erasure of women from the newly formed Irish state was part of the kind of victory of the kind of counter-revolutionary forces. Because for all the deference that was shown to Catholic teaching, it is important, I think, to also remember that the formal and constitutional structures of this new state were always steadfastly liberal democratic. And there was a post-independent elite that was committed to creating a state that was certainly Catholic, but also capitalist. That kind of regulation and control of sexual behavior, and particularly the erasure of women that Camilla spoke about, I think that allowed this state, this very kind of vulnerable state, to create a sense of social stability. So that the regulation of women's bodies and their their sexuality was about more than just marginalizing women, or at least I, I think how I see it. It was also about creating a kind of hegemony for this newly empowered Catholic middle class who kind of emerged as the bearers of stability and morality. Because the histories of the Magdalene laundries, the mother and baby homes, the reformatories, the industrial schools, the psychiatric hospitals, all of these institutions of incarcerations are also a history of poverty, of class, of inequality, all of which were endemic to the kind of modern capitalist class system. Mm, Yeah, thanks, Sinead. Could someone say a little bit more just briefly about the mother and baby homes and Magdalene laundries? What were they and how do they fit into this sort of nexus of the incarceration of women at the time? I mean, they were prisons in many respects. I mean, the the Magdalene laundries, to start there, were a network of laundries that were run by Catholic orders, um, very much, as, as Sinead pointed out, linked to capitalism because they were businesses who carried very large lucrative contracts for hospitals and for other institutions in Ireland. But their workforce was made up of women who were not there by choice, many of whom began in Magdalene laundries because they had become pregnant, often as a result of rape. And they were placed in these homes, often at a very young age. And remained there as an enslaved workforce over many, many years, which allowed the laundries to compete at very low rates and win very lucrative contracts, you know. And I think one of the things about Magdalene Laundries, it's, you know, sometimes this thing is said, you know, that, uh, oh, we were all in it together, that the Magdalene Laundries were just a, a result of their time or, you know, that everybody was silent. And I really think that's very important to challenge that sentiment. I mean, you had, as I say, church-led laundries, but you also had, again, that collusion with the state where 
women who did escape from Magdalen Laundries were regularly picked up by the police, by the Irish Guardi, and returned to those institutions, even where they had never committed any crime. And many were held there for many, many years. I agree with everything that's been said about how it suited the new Irish state to have this connection with the Catholic Church because it acted as a repressive force um, in a poverty ridden, backward state where mass emigration was the order of the day. But this uh, this isn't just an interesting history lesson. This is actually going on right to today. And it's still impacting on people and uh, even on the next generation, because like, for example, today, I was on a protest outside the doll where we were allowing adoptees and survivors of the mother and baby homes to speak because the government has just brought in a so-called redress scheme, which without you know going into all the details involves giving a mother €5,000 for the crime of forcing a woman into one of these homes, forcibly taking away her child and preventing her from having any information or connection with that child for you know, the rest of her life in many cases. And to this day, people in Ireland who are adopted from these homes have no right to their information. They don't have a birth cert. They don't have, you know, medical information. And the information they get is redacted. And they there has been a battle in recent years by all of the people involved to fight this. But the government, which is made up of Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael and the Green Party, have come back with another insulting and divisive scheme where they actually offer nothing to survivors, to babies that were born, to the people that were born there, unless they were six months in the home. I mean, it's not being in the home that was the actual thing that has caused these people lifelong trauma. It's the forcible separation from their parents. And what it shows is that Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael and, and other parties in the doll. Even Sinn Féin, which is emerging now as, as a third key party, hasn't really put forward any signs. None of, none of these parties really have been willing to take on the church heretofore. Any time that there's been a battle with the church, they've backed down. And here's another example. I mean, these religious orders that abused people are sitting on cash piles. Many of them have private health institutions that they run very profitably around Ireland and around the world. And no attempt really has been made to make them pay. They all have land and assets that they're selling off to developers right now. The money is there to financially compensate people. But we see it with health and education as well, that they're not willing to even allow proper sex education in our schools. And the government is standing over that. You know, the repeal movement has been a clear sign of when a movement did emerge that really challenged and broke a vital, you know, tenet of the Catholic Church, which which was the abortion ban. And, you know, it's that kind of movement, in my opinion, that we need again to completely separate church and state, because I just don't see the main political parties having the, the guts to do it unless the movement forces them to, like we did with repeal. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Ruth. We'll definitely touch on some more of this as the conversation goes on. I guess maybe it would be helpful before we get a little bit more up to date to talk about the introduction of the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution back in 1983, because abortion was effectively already illegal in the country. So what were the factors that precipitated this amendment being put into place and what led to it being uh, to the yes vote in the referendum to introduce it in the first place? I think, um, as you said, abortion was it was already illegal in Ireland um, under the Offences Against the Person Act legislation that was incorporated into the, you know, it, British legislation incorporated into into Irish law in 1922. I think the most useful framework to think about what happened in 1983 is to use um, the American writer uh, Susan Faludi's term backlash, that it was very much, I think, a backlash against the emergence of uh, the women's movement in Ireland in the 1970s, which was not interestingly focusing a great deal on the issue of abortion. One of the central issues preoccupying them at the time was access to contraception, which was also illegal until the very late 1970s. Um, So abortion wasn't really on the agenda. But in 1973, um, in the United States, abortion was made legal in the very infamous judgment, given what's happening in the United States at the moment, uh, Roe v. Wade. And the Supreme Court in Roe v. Wade ruled 
not that a woman had a right to an abortion per se, but that she had a right to privacy. And under her right to privacy, she was entitled to an abortion. Irish Conservatives became very worried about this judgment, and this was kind of reinforced in a case that was taken to the Irish Supreme Court called the McGee case in the late 1970s. And this was um, a a case uh, taken by a woman called Mrs. McGee and her husband, in which um, they challenged the illegal ban on contraception. And the court ruled that they had a right to marital privacy and therefore they had a right to contraception. So this kind of invocation, I suppose, of the kind of privacy framework led um, many kind of conservative activists to kind of fear that, I mean, I suppose they were already reacting to the kind of changes and the liberalization of Irish society in the 1970s. But they began to, I I think, fear that abortion could one day become legal um, in Ireland. They had tried to campaign against various other things. It wasn't just that they singled in on abortion, but I think abortion became one of the few issues that they got some traction on. They started to do a campaign against multi-denominational education, for example. Didn't get a huge amount of traction. But I think one of the issues that they got some traction on was around uh, abortion. So effectively, this group of conservative, a very small kind of, but nevertheless powerful and influential group, managed to convince the two leading political parties that Ruth talked about earlier, Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael, uh, kind of centre-right political parties, that there was a need for a constitutional ban on abortion. And they effectively wrote the Eighth Amendment and they managed to convince these leading parties to agree to hold a referendum. If you look at you, you know, the nature of the, the 83 Amendment campaign, it was a really kind of nasty, horrible time. I mean, Ireland was, I think, a very difficult place for a lot of people, but particularly for women in the 1980s. And if you even just kind of look, glance through any of the kind of newspaper coverage from the period, one of the things that in stark contrast to what we'll see when we come to talk about repeal, is the experience of women is completely erased. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, nobody is able to really talk about having an abortion. There's one one woman, um, a woman called Mary Holland, who was a journalist with the Irish Times and The Observer in London as well. And she came out and publicly talked about her abortion You know, she was literally publicly castigated, you know, literally condemned from the pulpit, endured horrific abuse as a result of of talking about her experience of abortion. And I think, you know, any woman who may have may have thought about talking about their experience just saw what they would have had to had to endure. You know, whenever I think of 83 and, and the time that the, the amendment was introduced, I mean, I was 14 at the time. I was, you know, first year of secondary school. But, you know, I think about just how powerful and pervasive the Catholic teaching and Catholic ethos was in Ireland at that time. So the school I went to was completely dominated by a Catholic ethos. The kind of narrative was of killing babies. That was the narrative, and this had to be prevented. Meanwhile, my own mother was at home after having 10 pregnancies, laboring under very difficult conditions at home with a domineering husband and an absolute. My mother had an absolute fear of the Catholic Church. And literally, as Sinead said, women were castigated from the pulpit. I have clear memories of my own mother thinking about even something like contraception, even when she had so many children. And quite literally, she would go to Mass on Sunday and there would be a message from the pulpit about the evils of contraception, the, you know, the children you had was a gift from God. I remember used to be what was said in in, in my own house. So there was, as, as Sinead describes it, those, those kind of very prominent um, examples, but there was also a very, very dominant impact of the Catholic Church in terms of their power in education, in our maternity hospitals, uh, pretty much in, in every aspect of society. And I think many women were fearful at the time. And, you know, with just reason when you consider the number of women that were incarcerated for stepping outside of that very limited 
parameters within which a woman was was expected to live her life. Yeah, definitely. So is it right to suggest then that the, the constitutional amendment, what was perhaps especially pernicious about it is that it brought in this parallel uh, value of the the rights to life of the fetus and the mother. And so I suppose therefore baking into that the suggestion that at some point there might arise a situation where someone has to choose between those two things. And I guess what then was the response to campaigners in the wake of this uh, amendment coming into effect? Well, just even before you move on, Chris, and Sinead, you correct me if I get this wrong, but I mean, my understanding of the turnout in the 1983 referendum was quite low. It wasn't as high, I think, as as this time around, but it wasn't, turnout then was slightly higher than referendums would be now. I mean, I think you can look at kind of interesting things about where turnout was high. Turnout was higher in middle class areas than it was maybe in working class areas, where I think the reverse is what happens actually during repeal. Uh, and it's funny as well, because I, I remember I was a teenager at the time and my parents would have been very Catholic and very much would have voted for the amendment. But I do remember like one of my older brothers saying, hang on, women could actually die from this. So it isn't like that point of view didn't get any airing. It did. And actually, probably looking back, it's amazing that a third of people did vote against the amendment given the power of the church at that time. And it should be said as well that shortly after us, you know, a young girl died giving birth alone. And there were many examples of what a hypocrisy the amendment was, given the shame and stigma that persisted if you became pregnant and you weren't married. Hmm. It would be interesting to talk a little bit about some of the the activism that did take place then in, in the wake of this, um, I think, Sinead, in, in one of the chapters, you talk about you know efforts shifting towards ensuring that women had information about how they could travel to Britain, I suppose, mainly to access abortions and how these efforts were blocked by anti-abortion campaigners and the courts. And of course, this work was all being done in a time before the Internet. So there were many challenges, I guess. Could you could you speak a little bit about some of the, the work that was done in these years following 83 some of the strategies used by campaigners and the, and the challenges faced. The important point to remember in all of this is that despite the fact that abortion was illegal in Ireland, Irish women always accessed abortion. They continued to have abortions in numbers um, that were probably comparable to Britain and other European countries. There were huge obstacles in accessing abortion, but they, from the time abortion was legal in Britain in 1967, Irish women travelled to access abortion. And as you said there, Chris, 83 was an enormous blow, I think, to the feminist movement in Ireland. And then following on from that again, there was an attempt to legalise divorce in Ireland and that failed. So the 1980s was a really difficult time to be in Ireland. And yet, despite all of these difficulties and the open hostility, I think, in which feminists and socialists and and other activists operated in, they did continue to support and ensure uh, that women had access to information about abortion. Because after 83, the ban on abortion was copper fastened. The kind of Catholic right wing went after kind of things like information. So student unions in in Trinity, UCD, DCU, others were in their kind of student handbooks, gave numbers of clinics in Britain, because as you pointed out, I mean, we have to remember, and sometimes when we think about just how easy it is to access information, whatever information we need on our phones these days, it was really difficult to access information. So activists had operated a phone line. But even things like making a phone call, again, I think we forget about that because we, you know, we all have mobile phones. But I remember talking to activists who talked about, you know, there might only be one phone box in a village and queuing down and then you had to phone and hope that somebody would answer this phone line to get the information that you needed. Making phone calls, was especially phone calls to Britain, it was all extremely expensive travel was very difficult there were no kind of cheap airfares or or that so all of these things made accessing abortion in Ireland really really difficult and and still 
women went through all sorts of obstacles in order to get to get that access. And one of the things that activists did was they they did fundraising, they operated uh, phone lines, they made connections. And I think given that that what you were saying earlier, Chris, about how many of your listeners are going to be from Britain, I mean, I do think it is important to remember and acknowledge the solidarity that Irish women experienced from their sisters in Britain. Organisations were set up in Britain specifically to support Irish women, to give them accommodation, to help them get to clinics, to ease the burden of travel and the financial obstacles. And there was there was huge solidarity, I think, between women's groups and organisations that, again, is often kind of written out of a lot of kind of mainstream historical accounts. Thanks, Sinead. Um I guess there may be two things that would be interesting to touch on as we come up a little bit more towards the campaign to repeal. Uh, one is the X case in 1992, and then I suppose the death of Savita Halapanavar 20 years later. Are these kind of qualitative turning points in the struggle for the repeal that uh, I guess emerged in the years afterwards? And if so, could anyone just say a little bit about why they were significant? I was out of the country for the X case. I was working overseas at the time, um, so can't comment firsthand as to the sort of mood in Ireland at the time. But I certainly know that what happened with the X case, and I do remember this very clearly, was it took the idea out of the abstract and into the everyday. And people could very much see the horrors of what the Eighth Amendment did, the fact that a young 14 year old child who had been raped, who was what happened with the ex case was that she was attempting to travel overseas over to to England to have an abortion. And her parents inquired with the Irish police if there was some way that they could gather DNA so that the perpetrator could be brought to justice. And this is what alerted uh, the authorities to the fact that she was traveling. And there was a court injunction placed to stop her from traveling. I do remember the X case quite well in that I do agree with the way you posed it. It's those two events of the X case and, you know, the tragic death of Savita were definitely two really important events on the road to repeal. One of the things that I remember about the X case is, as was explained by by Camilla, how, you know, broke into the public sphere was very unusual because apparently the parents wanted to get uh, DNA from the fetus, or that was the rumour, nobody fully knows, I don't think. But what it led to was it really opened people's eyes in Ireland to the fact that this could be your daughter, this could be somebody you know. And there was quite a large and quick response, actually, with protests. I saw some footage from Reeling in the Ears there lately, and... I do remember at the time being on protests and one of the things was schoolgirls who literally were bursting out of the school gates to go on a protest that was held during the day, during school time. And lots of stories about the nuns locking the school gates. One in particular I heard about on in a school near, near where I'm living and, you know, really did have a, a large impact. And also on, on the banners at the time in, in that footage, the idea of repeal of the Eighth Amendment came on the agenda, like it was raised on placards and in the the discourse. But the problem was there was no party willing to to go there at that time. It wasn't that long since it was being inserted in the first place. What happened then is that the government tried to, to quell things by putting in amendments to allow travel, to allow information. Whereas the so-called pro-life movement had been attacking those because it was so encouraged by the Eighth Amendment. And so that kind of took a little bit of the pressure off because people were able to get the information about what phone numbers to ring in, in Britain. And then the government tried to they tried to close off the suicide issue for a long, long time. This this issue which the girl contended or the family contended that the threat of suicide should be enough to allow you to have an abortion because that was an equal right to life. And it also brought home to people that you you simply cannot put words in to the constitution that will so-called protect life, you know, that will stop abortion in reality. And I think then Savita's situation 
which is a long time since the X case, obviously had an even more powerful impact. But it had an even more powerful impact because the country had changed too at that point throughout the whole 1990s. You'd already had like a a female president elected and lots of other challenges to, to the church, people stopping going to mass. Just a whole change had been taking place in the country. But most importantly, you had kind of a global feminist awakening going on in society at the time that repeal and Savita's situation um, happened. Hmm, yeah, thanks, Ruth. Does someone want to say a little bit more about the groundswell of activism and the, the shift in opinion that was going on at the time? Yeah, I, I might come in around 2012, which was the year that Savita Halepanavar died, because I think there's absolutely no doubt but that that had a, had a significant impact. I mean, I'm sure all of us can remember exactly I like it was yesterday when the news broke and uh, was broken by Kitty Holland that, that a woman had died in those circumstances. But I think it's important to say that there was other things happening at the same time as well, that the pro-choice movement, for want of a better expression, had really began to galvanize earlier on that year and activism was increasing. So earlier on in the same year, there was a very large meeting in a hotel on O'Connell Street in Dublin, which was to mark 20 years since the X case. There was also the very first March for Choice, which became an annual event in Ireland, which grew very, very large um, right up until 2019. The first March for Choice happened in 2012, so before we knew about the death of Savita. And there were there was left-wing politicians in the Dáil uh, who were fighting for changes to the law at the time. So when Savita died, there was already an infrastructure. I mean, the infrastructure has been there for 35 years. I think it's important to say that there's been a pro-choice, an active pro-choice movement in Ireland since then, but you know, as with all social movements, that you know the tides kind of shift from times. But in 2012, there was quite a lot happening already, and I think when when Savita, you know, absolutely appalling situation that happened when a woman died in Ireland because she was refused an abortion that she needed to save her life, and when she was told by a senior medical healthcare professional that the reason was because Ireland is a Catholic country. I mean, this is the reason that she was given as to why that her pregnancy wouldn't be terminated when it was so clear to her and to her husband that, that this was needed. So it's just to bring home that point that it wasn't that there was nothing happening and then that Savita's death occurred. Hmm. Yeah, thanks, Camilla. Well, Ruth, perhaps it'd be interesting to come to you here because in in the foreword to the book, you write how as a newly elected TD and an activist, you had the unusual position in 2014, so a couple of years later, of introducing a law into Parliament while openly also breaking one at the same time, which is obviously quite an intriguing sentence. Could you give us a bit more information about what you're referring to here and some of the activities you were involved in? (laughs) Yeah. Um, Well, yeah, I think what Camilla has said that by even before the death of Savita, which which is important to that movements were being made to challenge the abortion ban in a much more decisive way than had been the case. So after the death of Savita, there were important demonstrations and discussions about the best way forward. And it became clearer that we needed to repeal the Eighth Amendment, lock, stock and barrel, get it out of the Constitution. So there was a continuation of people being incarcerated. There was a a young woman who was in care or a ward of court who wasn't allowed to have an abortion. And that prompted me just shortly after I got elected and, and my party to discuss proposing a bill in the Dáil to repeal the Eighth Amendment. And we published it at first stage. But we, we didn't have really dull time, unfortunately, at that point to, to put it for a full second stage. But meanwhile, I was discussing with my colleagues uh, in Rosa and I just had the idea of highlighting the abortion pills. There had been a very important feminist event in Ireland in 1971 where women imported pills from the north, contraception from the north, and they brought it back down on a train. So we had the idea of sort of mimicking that event, but this time with abortion pills. So 
it was quite a nervy thing to do because we didn't know what was going to happen. And there was a we made contact with one of the leading online telemedicine providers, Women on Web, who were very approving of us taking the action. And it had a huge impact in the sense that we got a, a lot of publicity for it. And Sinead also took part in that. But it, it did put the abortion pills more on the public agenda, which I can go into again. But it was strange. I think all of us here, I think, on this call would be absolutely in agreement that you use whatever platform you have. The doll was an important platform. The fact that there were socialists elected, well, like myself, at that time was very fortuitous because we were able to use the parliament to put bills like that to show people that it was possible to very simply repeal the Eighth Amendment and to build up support for that idea and to put pressure on the political parties in the parliament to do it. Unfortunately, they weren't willing to do it at that time, but that didn't prevent us then from looking outside the parliament and trying to, you know, make it much more of an issue, the idea of we have to repeal the amendment and we have to fully repeal it, not put something else in its place, which was what was being sort of spoken about potentially at the time, or what was being spoken of was very limited abortion for fatal fetal abnormality for rape, which is very few uh, people, you'd still continue on with the hypocrisy, the travel, etc. And so what we were trying to do with the civil disobedience, with the abortion pills and Rosa was to actually make it impossible, if you like, for the government to just bring in a very limited law that would leave out the vast majority by sending the message to them, well, there's going to be a repeal referendum. And if you don't fully allow people have the right to choose They'll continue to take abortion pills. That it will continue regardless. And obviously, with the availability of the internet and, and the abortion pills, it is a game changer in terms of trying to ban abortion. It's very difficult to ban abortion when somebody can get a pill in the post. You know, I do think that that obviously did play a big role, putting pressure on the politicians who were on the Oireachtas, the, the parliamentary committee, that finally made the decision as to how to proceed. They, and, and in some ways, it allowed them to use as an excuse to their own supporters. Oh, we have to legislate. Women are using these pills in their bedrooms. So that was what I meant with that comment of within parliament and extra parliamentary activity. Mm, yeah, thanks, Ruth. Well, let's talk a bit about the, the campaign as it coalesced in the run up to the referendum. Uh, so Together for Yes emerged, although it wasn't just sort of founded out of nothing. I guess it was more about bringing together a large number of different groups. Um, so yeah, when did it come on the scene uh, and why did it get created, as it were? Together for Yes came about as a kind of a discussion among lots of different groups that were campaigning at the time. And I suppose one of the lessons that was learned from the 1983 amendment was that there was the need for a coordinated campaign because there had been, I suppose, lots of different emphasis and some kind of conflict between different groups that were emerging that allowed, I think, feminist side to a clear kind of split and uncoordinated. So there was a kind of, a, I think, a con consensus among most activists that we needed to have uh, a kind of broad base campaign and that we were all taking account of difference, that we were all kind of operating roughly within the kind of same framework. So Together for Yes formally brought together the coalition, which was already itself a coalition of about 100 different organisations, the Coalition to Repeal the Eighth Amendment, which I was part of, and uh, the abortion rights campaign that came out of that movement that Camilla talked about in 2012, which had a huge amount of particularly young activists and also kind of activists right around the country, and uh, the National Women's Council, which had been a kind of long-standing NGO-type feminist organisation in Ireland. So those three came together to formally establish Together for Yes. But I think one of the things that comes out through Camilla's research, and I, I think that's what's really important and revealing about her research, is where all of the kind of energy for repeal and all of the kind of activism and enthusiasm, it really came from the grassroots campaign. Sometimes people who'd never been involved in politics before, I mean, I don't I'll let Camilla speak to this better, but I, I just want to kind of say is that 
because sometimes the way that the repeal campaign is kind of presented in the mainstream media is that it was a campaign of politicians. So after, you know, the victory in 2018, various political commentators in the paper of records, the Irish Times, were saying oh, it was Leo Varadkar, who was then the sea shocker, the prime minister. He really won this campaign. He got it on board. And it was seen as a kind of mainstream political campaign. One of my memories of the campaign during those kind of the months leading up to uh, the referendum in May 2018 was journalists and politicians and kind of professional type activists were always saying the campaign was too sloppy. It didn't have proper leadership. It, It wasn't professional. It was too amateur. We were always being told every week we were being told we were going to lose this because we weren't professional. And I think one of the things that Camilla's work brings into a kind of very clear perspective is that one of the reasons I think for this is that for these kind of journalists and professional type campaigners, the type of energy and activism that really characterized repeal is invisible to them. The only political movement they can understand is one that kind of infiltrates the the corridors of Leinster House, the Irish Parliament and has some sort of kind of charismatic leader, usually a a kind of male leader at the front of it. And they couldn't see the kind of type of campaigning um, that that was really characteristic and gave so much energy to repeal. And it's why we really won this campaign. The people who went out knocking on doors every single night of the week for months on end. Yeah, thanks, Sinead. Camilla, do you want to speak a little bit about the wealth of testimony in the book? Yeah, some of the experiences that people shared with you about what it was like campaigning sort of on on a grassroots level. I described somewhere else about, you know, the origins of the idea was to do some research on what was going on. It was really just my own busyness at the time of rushing from work to home to get out to the canvas to you know, and every every night there was bigger and bigger numbers on the canvas of people who lived beside me who I'd never met before, you know, tens of thousands of people all over Ireland, as Sinead says, just knocking on doors. And, you know, it really just struck me that I, the only time I think in my lifetime I had ever felt any sort of a groundswell like that before was when Ireland had a campaign against privatisation of water, the introduction of water charges was probably the only other time that came for me in my experience as close to that really strong groundswell of activism. You know, just thousands of people coming out, trying to convince their neighbours, trying to convince people on the streets that it was time to get rid of this archaic ban on abortion that was in our constitution. And I don't think I had ever experienced anything like it. So I just thought, you know, I needed to put a mic into these people's hands, like I mean, through an online survey and ask people, you know, why are you campaigning? What's going on? And, you know, what emerged then was that many of these people had been campaigning for decades. I mean, a third of the people that I spoke to, and I mentioned over 400 canvases, had been involved for many, many years. And as Sinead said, then there was another third of people who just got involved in 2018, who felt so strongly about this that they got up off their couch. They didn't see that the the route to change was simply to, to go and vote on the 25th of May. They saw their role as being activists on the ground, having conversations with people, which was often much broader than simply repealing the eighth. I mean, it was a real time of politicization, of consciousness raising. I thought it was a really, you know, high point in, in sort of grassroots feminism in Ireland. And, and many of those people are still active today. And there are, you know, people have got involved in political parties, people have got involved in anti-racism community movements, people have got involved in housing action campaigns. There has been, a, you know, a, a lasting impact, I think, of what happened in 2018, which is exactly as Sinead described it. I mean, it was happening in towns and villages all over Ireland. I mean, even if you look at things like the the way that the vote was was a national vote, I mean, there was huge support in rural areas, which had been written off by the mainstream media outlets. Even the Guardian newspaper published an article about how rural Ireland could potentially lose the referendum. And this wasn't the case at all, because actually, 
at the grassroots. There was enormous support. I mean, it was very much the that notion as Sinead described it of that kind of old style of, of leadership and where campaigns, you know, germinated in the Houses of Parliament. But also, I think, RTE, the Irish national broadcaster, uh, very much supported that narrative as well. I mean, I don't know, thinking of yourself, even, Ruth, as somebody who, from me looking on, was probably never less on the television in terms of talking about something you'd been active on for so long, because suddenly it was new faces and those faces were people who had actively opposed, you know, who voted against bills that were brought into the doll, who had even their introduction of the Citizens Assembly was seen by many people as a delay tactic. At any stage, they could have just called a referendum for repeal. And then suddenly they were presenting themselves and being pushed forward in the mainstream media as as the architects of change. I really do hope that this book does, as Sinead says, set the record straight on that. But the fight is not over. And I think that's something that, that we need to talk about as well. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Just before we go on to talk about the kind of post-referendum reality, one group that it comes up in the book quite a lot that was part of the coalition to repeal the eighth was migrants and ethnic minorities for reproductive justice. Uh, and some of the testimony in the book from members of that campaign is very interesting in highlighting, I guess, some of the problematic parts of the repeal movement and with um, Together for Yes, maybe specifically. What were some of these criticisms and why are they important to sort of take note of and acknowledge whilst we're also sort of celebrating the success ultimately of the repeal campaign? Well, I mean, I think what people that I spoke to from Merge were critical of was a sense, and not just people from Merge, there was other people, other ordinary activists as well, that the message of the campaign was very much a individualist, middle class story of tragedy almost, which shifted somewhat from where the reproductive rights movement had been before that. So there were criticisms, it's absolutely fair to say, there were criticisms of the message of Together for Yes, how it didn't talk about, you know, working class women, uh, women of colour, people who were most impacted by the Eighth Amendment and who are most impacted by the restrictions of our laws today. And I think, you know, the importance of gathering criticisms like that is to engage with them, perhaps not make that same mistake uh, in the future, if we do accept that it, that that was a mistake, I mean, my own sense is that we will never know if the result would have been different if the message had been more reproductive rights, more focused on inequality, on a social justice agenda. But I suspect that it would still have carried, and it would still have carried with the majority. That certainly was was my sense from that kind of grassroots activism that I talked about a few minutes ago. I mean, I think Sinead is right that there was an awful lot of sort of middle class, middle aged male in particular journalists who were quite dismissive of the campaign in general. I do think the campaign in terms of criticisms was very close to Fine Gael and to the presiding government and to the Minister for Health in particular. And the danger of that is just that these are very establishment figures who didn't have a good record on women's rights at all. They didn't have any record on women's rights, obviously, and were actively involved in, for example, in the cervical check scandal that was going on at the time that had outsourced the screening and, in my view, led to uh, the misdiagnosis and death of a number of women. It was very noticeable that people who had socialist voices and pro-choice voices were limited. And I think that that would have happened in the marriage equality campaign with it would have been seen, oh, you present a certain type of image. But in actual fact, uh, I think that there was a bit of fear of straying from the message about health. So people were told language that they should and shouldn't use on the doorstep and I think it's worth making those points purely because it's important to correct the record, but also to be clear on on how the campaign was won. And I mean, in my view, the campaign was won because it was a movement that was led by young people and women. 
in particular. And a lot of LGBT plus people played a huge role in the campaign, but also working class communities were very responsive to the message of voting yes. It was just a pity there wasn't more working class voices, I thought, in the campaign. But that's not the fault of Together for Yes fully. I think the media in particular wanted a certain type of campaign where the establishment wanted to claim the credit. And once they saw the bandwagon moving towards a progressive yes vote, they quickly jumped on. And in Dublin Castle then, as would be well known, you know, Leo Varadkar talking about a quiet revolution when it was anything but a quiet revolution. It was a boisterous, persistent, loud movement that won repeal. Not this idea of the establishment suddenly seeing the error of their ways. You know, they had to be forced in that direction. It's just important to register that and uh, the fact that all around the country, actually, change had taken place hugely. The, the fact that rural and urban, there wasn't such a huge difference is, is extremely important because most people now, they're part of the working class as well, you know. So I think lessons should be just learned there, I think. Yeah, I, I agree with both Camilla and Ruth. I mean, one of the things that I think happens certainly towards the end of the campaign and you kind of become a victim of your own success in some ways is that mainstream politicians, they love to kind of attach themselves to a successful campaign. And in those kind of final weeks, if you were anywhere around kind of together for yes, particularly in the last kind of week, 10 days in the headquarters, you know, you were tripping over politicians, the ones that six months beforehand, you know, were if if they saw you were kind of running out of the way, lest you'd kind of try to corner them about their support. The people who won repeal were not politicians. Uh, They were the people who were out canvassing, campaigning on the streets and who had literally never stopped campaigning since 1983. They were the people, they were the unsung heroes of the repeal movement. Repeal was won not because of politicians, but in spite of politicians. And particularly, you know, I think one of the most egregious things about the aftermath of the campaign is, like as people have said about Leo Varadkar, you know, trying to bask in the glory of uh, of repeal. And, and particularly Leo Varadkar, because Fine Gael was the last political party to come on board. Even Fianna Fáil, which is often perceived of as more conservative on kind of social issues, they even came on in support before Fianna Gael. And the only reason that Leo Varadkar and Fianna Gael came on board was that repeal had reached such a momentum that not to be on board would have damaged them politically. In these kind of mainstream campaigns, in these kind of campaigns that involve all different political forces, there is a kind of tendency to go to the centre and to create this kind of very liberal picture that is not too kind of critical, not too radical. And there is a cost to that. And lots of groups, quite rightly, I think, felt marginalised. Um, groups like Merge and other kind of working class communities in how that kind of certain version of the campaign was kind of presented. But for me, the repeal campaign is what Camilla describes in her book. It is the women, working class communities, rural communities, tens of thousands of people putting in the hard work and the graft to get repeal across uh, across the lines. And that, for me, is what won repeal. It was, it was nothing else. Yeah, thanks, Sinead. Camilla? Yeah, well, I mean, just to move it on, even from after the referendum, because I think if there was ever, if we at all needed confirmation as to where the mainstream parties lie. It has been their behaviour since the referendum and how they introduced legislation which has many, many restrictions which impact the same people who were most impacted by the Eighth Amendment. I mean, the Irish law as it stands has significant barriers. It wasn't out of naivety. It wasn't out of not understanding. They introduced the law that was introduced despite Ruth and other people in the Dáil, uh, expert groups uh, coming in and speaking to them about all of the reasons why we shouldn't have the tight gestational limit that's in our laws, why we shouldn't have a three-day wait, which is something that the World Health Organization argues against. So, you know, whatever you can say about 
the message of the Together for Yes campaign and how it could have or should have been more inclusive, you certainly cannot locate any responsibility on the quality of the laws that we have with the campaign message. I mean, Sinead, you may know more about this from being on the inside, but there was some, my understanding from talking to people is that certainly the impression was given by senior politicians that there would be scope to shape the legislation after the referendum. And there was such a clear mandate. There was nothing to stop the government of the day saying, oh, wow, there's huge support for this. Let's listen to the experts. Let's listen to the voices of women. Let's listen to the stories and let's introduce good quality legislation that is going to ensure that people have safe access to abortion that they can afford and that's local to where they live. But in many respects, they did everything they could to introduce the bare bones of what they could get away with. Mm. And as I understand it, actual access is still very sort of patchy around the country. Is that right? Well, I mean, the, the official figure that I uh, use in the book, I know, Sinead, you also used it in, uh, in work that you've done with the research by the National Women's Council. But the official figure is around 10% now from speaking to people within uh, START, which is an organization of GPs and obstetricians who are pro-choice. My understanding is that the figure is around 15 to 20% of GPs around the country are currently uh, openly prescribing abortion pills. But we have a situation where there's 19 maternity hospitals in Ireland and only 10 of them are delivering full abortion services. Now, I have to say that that completely blows my mind. These are publicly funded hospitals where people have the right to access all uh, treatments that are available to them under law. And you have this situation where almost half of maternity hospitals in Ireland are not providing the service and are not being sanctioned in any way. So I think there's the quality of the legislation, which is really poor, which needs to be brought in line with uh, World Health Organization recommendations at a minimum. And then we also have a situation where we have this real issue with access, where we had a promise to introduce safe access zones, which was goes back to 2018, Simon Harris committed on a number of occasions to the introduction of these laws. We're still waiting for this to happen. And actually, they may happen quite soon. But if that does happen, it has been again because of bottom-up grassroots campaigning. It has been because of pressure that has been put from organizations like Together for Safety, based in Limerick, but also ARC, ROSA, other organizations, pushing from below for this legislation which is the exact same thing that happened in the UK in terms of safe access zones, which happened in Australia in terms of safe access zones, where the change didn't come from politicians, where the change came from, as Ruth says in the foreword to the book, change comes from struggle. I, I was on the committee when there was a discussion um, and a debate around what we would recommend. And, for example, the three-day waiting period wasn't something that was voted on at that committee. One of the other problems that's emerged since is that people are still continuing to have to travel who have very tragic medical diagnosis for severe fetal abnormality. Now, again, in other countries, a distinction isn't even made between severe and fatal fetal abnormality. That is something that's particularly been emphasised in Ireland rather than elsewhere. Because we, we all know that it's very difficult to even tell the difference between those by, by medics. But that means that, and because you have a criminal, very heavy criminal sanction for a doctor that strays from the law that was put in there as well, which we argued against, it acts as a, a chilling effect. And it means that doctors are, are slow to say something's a fatal fetal abnormality. So we're still finding that I would have been contacted by women who were in this position that they still have to travel despite having a very uh, difficult diagnosis. And I, I, I think that we all agree that was never the intention of people in Ireland who voted yes, because one of the you know very emotive and moving things had been that whole situation. So I think that that's something we have to challenge, but that will be very difficult because it was very clear that politicians, quite cowardly politicians, took a majority decision that, they weren't going to go there and they didn't want the whole thing about disability, for example, coming up. And we have a situation where Sinn Féin won't support that either. 
and could be the biggest party in the next doll, uh, potentially. So I think that there will be uh, very difficult issues. And I think there are definitely going to be big battlegrounds as well as the issues that Camilla mentioned about the, the, the exclusion zones and the fact that their doctors are still allowed just not provide this service. Only for the abortion pill, of course, they're able to get away with that because people can just go and get a prescription from another doctor. And I also think it's quite ironic that we should acknowledge that during the pandemic, people have been having effectively telemedicine abortions with pills, which is the kind of thing that we highlighted and that Women and Web highlighted, and they've been having them safely. And so the idea of two visits to a doctor being necessary is been blown out of the water and I think we should use that in the upcoming debate. Yeah, and just on that three day wait, because again, you know, the, the kind of central message of the Together for Yes campaign was trust doctors, trust women, trust doctors, something that it's sometimes um you know people say maybe there was too much emphasis on that. But the legislation even undermines that. So it even undermines that message because the three day wait, it's such a patronizing degrading piece of legislation for someone like me but for somebody who maybe lives many many miles from a GP who's prescribing for somebody who maybe lives in direct provision for somebody who's in a coercive relationship for somebody who has you know huge burden of care in terms of child care or elder care it can be something that actually just makes abortion impossible to access and we know that doctors We'll talk to people. So if you think that the kind of justification for this three day wait is to give people a cooling off period, it's actually very insulting to doctors to think that in consultation with somebody who's pregnant, that a doctor would not be able to read the situation and provide the relevant supports and on the very rare occasion that somebody maybe does need a little bit of space, of course, that's going to be what would happen in a normal doctor patient relationship it's this all the time this control this legislative control over what people who are pregnant can do with their bodies there should be no laws in my opinion there should be no laws at all and you know it's just i think so important that we challenge all of these barriers as they emerge that was camilla fitzsimons sinead kennedy and ruth coppinger on radicals and conversation A big thank you to each of them for coming on the show. If you want to keep listening, then head over to patreon.com forward slash Pluto Press, where members can access the unabridged version of this and other episodes of the podcast. The new book, Repealed, Ireland's Unfinished Fight for Reproductive Rights, is out now. Podcast listeners can get 50% off through plutobooks.com. You just have to use the coupon podcast at the checkout. We'll be back in December for our final episode of the year. So until then, thank you for listening and goodbye.